Hello. Welcome to the Governance Blueprint series. My name is John Landgrave, and I'm a Power Platform Architect and part of the global Black Belt team here at Microsoft. In this series, we're going to cover the essential governance, security, administration, and management capabilities that you can implement in order to provide a strong, secure foundation for enabling innovation on the Power Platform. In the first episode, we'll review the fundamentals of Power Platform governance. In subsequent episodes, we'll cover how to configure the default environment, your tenant, and Microsoft Teams to allow secure and managed access to all platform features. Then we'll discuss the considerations for creating an enterprise governance strategy and the basic steps for implementing this in your organization. So let's get started. All the information presented in this series is available online at docs.microsoft.com and there will be links to all the referenced articles available at the end of each episode. After working with companies to implement the Power Platform over the last four years, I began to see some common themes emerging. In fact, they never lacked for access for information. Microsoft is very good at producing documentation. What they have asked for, however, is context. Think about driving by a construction site and seeing all the materials laid across the site. Even if you know what the materials are for, you don't necessarily know what the building is going to be. But having a blueprint gives you the context you need to understand how those materials will be used. After this episode, you should have a clearer idea of the problem you're trying to solve and the materials you'll need to build your enterprise strategy. When I discuss governance with large enterprise customers, they bring up a lot of different issues that they're concerned about. But it basically boils down to three things. The first is data exfiltration. They want to make sure if they enable this platform, that the applications built on the platform cannot allow data to leave their organization unless they're able to monitor the data and how it's being used. The two ways this might occur are number one, using the connector infrastructure against external systems, or two, using electronic mail to take data out of the system and push it out through an email message. Their second concern is that a user who doesn't understand how the connector infrastructure works might create an unintended licensing consequence by using premium connectors in an application and not understanding that that requires all users to also have premium licenses. The third major issue is that of app sprawl. Their primary concern is either that users will create an application and share them with a large number of users and they won't have control over that application anymore, or that users will create applications and abandon them, causing a lot of applications to be in the system, but taking up space, but they're not aware of it. So we're going to look at how all three of these issues can be resolved uh, by using the standard governance capabilities of the Power Platform. There's a constant struggle for control and management anytime a system like the Power Platform is implemented where we have great new capabilities to innovate, but those capabilities are in the hands of citizen developers. The first reaction for most IT organizations is let's shut it down. Of course, the business is saying, light it up. We need this capability. It's something we want to build on. So what you end up with is an arm wrestling match. In the absence of any clear and concrete governance that's made available to citizen developers so they understand the right way to use the platform, this constant arm wrestling match will go on. What we hope to do here is to show you that by building a blueprint, that arm wrestling match can turn into a handshake. So let's step back for a second and take a look at some of the fundamentals around the types of applications and the types of environments you can use to build those applications. Building your environment strategy with the Power Platform is one of the most important things that you'll do in order to enable the citizen development effort. So the first environment type is one that's designed to build Office 365 collaborative applications. This environment is specifically tuned to be used with Office assets like SharePoint, Exchange, OneDrive and others. In fact, when you first get your tenant, you will have this default environment and it is already configured to allow you to write office applications and to extend those applications. There will be scenarios, however, where you want to use connectors other than office connectors. And to do that, you'll create additional environments in which you can build business applications that take advantage of the over 600 data connectors, as well as many of the other features of the platform beyond just Power Apps and Power Automate. In addition to business applications, we've also provided you 
with environments that are tied to specific team sites. So this allows you to extend a team site with Power Apps and Power Automate cloud flows that will be used in the context of the team in which they're installed and built. It's a very powerful capability. It's important to understand that business applications have access to the complete set of capabilities of Dataverse. Where Teams applications will use Dataverse for Teams, which is a scaled down version of Dataverse, which primarily gives you the ability to do read, write, create, delete operations, but with a real relational database. We have a lot of customers who built pretty complex applications on SharePoint type by tying lists together, but that's not really a good way uh, to implement a high performance and secure system. So when you look at these applications and these environments that you'll build them in, you'll have a default environment. There'll be one default environment. As I said, that's assigned uh, at the time that your tenant is created. You can have as many non-default environments as you have space to create them. And each non-default environment, when it's created, will take a minimum of one gigabyte of available space. Teams applications, using the Dataverse for Teams environments, have a limited number based on the number of licensed Office 365 users. Basically, it's around one Dataverse for Teams environment for each 20 users in your organization. It's also important to point out that there are two pools of storage available for you to draw this one gigabyte that's required to create new environments. The first, the default storage pool, will be used for your default environment and for any non-default environments that you create into which you will build business applications. There's a separate pool of data that's used in order to provision Dataverse for Teams environments. And so as you build out Dataverse for Teams, you will cap that out at the number of environments that you have, whereas when you build business environments, that will get capped out as your storage is tapped out in your default environment. You do get additional storage in the default environment based on premium licenses that you purchase. It's also possible to buy additional storage for applications that need access to large amounts of data. So one of the key considerations that you're going to make as you begin counseling your business users to build applications is what kind of environment should they be using. If it's a personal and team productivity application, the default environment uh, typically is the one that you'll use. It's easy to get to. Everyone has access to it. Uh, everyone, in fact, is a maker in the default environment. So everyone is able to build personal and team productivity applications. For simple business use cases, you may continue to use the default environment. But this is also a place where you may start considering using Teams environments and Dataverse for Teams. As I mentioned earlier, Dataverse for Teams gives you more capability, especially around managing your data. As the applications become more complex or mission critical or organization wide, as the number of users and complexity grows, you'll lean more towards the business environments in order to build applications that use the complete set of Dataverse services. When you're ready to start building out your governance strategy, you're going to need a set of materials. This is a list of the things that you'll need, and we'll cover where these are used in subsequent episodes. But first, you'll need a global tenant administrator. That tenant administrator is going to need to assign some permissions in order to get everything working properly. You'll also need some Power Platform Service Administrator accounts. These are accounts that you can give to folks who need the ability to administer the Dataverse environments for all the different folks in your organization. In addition, you'll need at least one Teams Administrator permission. We'll look at how that permission is used when we talk about implementing governance for Dataverse for Teams. You'll also need someone who can assign an Office Security and Compliance Log Read permission. We will use this permission to read the Office audit logs and to get you information about how the apps in your organization are being consumed by your users. We also recommend that you have at least two per-user licenses. A per-user license gives you access to the premium features of the platform, and these features are going to be necessary in order for you to install and configure things like the Center of Excellence Starter Kit. You'll also need one per flow license, and we'll get into more detail about why you need this when we talk about the CUE Starter Kit. Uh, but suffice it to say that the flow license ensures that all of your flows inside of that Starter Kit will run properly. 
And finally, you'll need the capability on demand to create security groups that will control access to environments. So that's it for the first episode. We've covered what governance is. We've talked about the basics of environment strategy. Uh, we've also talked about the materials you're going to need to go build out your environments and governance strategy. So let's go on to episode two.